In this video, I wanted to see if I could beat a hardcore Nuzlocke with Pokemon Crystal with only Pokemon with a base stat total of 400 or less. Every single Pokemon has 6 base stats that range from 1 to 255, and the total of these 6 base stats is often the best representation of the potential a Pokemon has in battle. As a general rule, the higher the BTS, the stronger the Pokemon. For example, legendary Pokemon have the highest average BTS as they tend to hover around the 700 range. Pseudo legendaries tend to be around 600, and then third stage evolutions sit around 500. All the way at the bottom of the barrel, however, you have Pokemon that are 400 and below. So what do Pokemon with a BTS of 400 and below look like? These 11 little powerhouses, and I'm going to need every single one of them if I want to become the champion of Johto, because in a Pokemon Nuzlocke, if a Pokemon faints, it's considered dead and must be released. I can also only catch the first encounter per area. The rest of the rules for this run can be seen on screen now and in the description. Let's go see if these amazing legendary Pokemon have what it takes to become champions. One quick thing first though, I'm now going to do that YouTuber thing where I point out that only about 12% of all the people that watch my videos are subscribed, so I'd really appreciate it if you enjoy my content, show your support and hit that subscribe button for more content, and also remember to like this video. Now on with the run. First off we've got starter choices, and Totodile, Chikorita and Cyndaquil all have a BTS lower than 400. However, I've decided to ban any Pokemon that evolves to have more than 400 BTS so I can't use any of these Pokemon. I pick Cookie the Cyndaquil for now and then we can go off and get our first real encounter through the run. Past Cherry Grove City, we can start this run for real by catching a Caterpie we name Sponge. Sponge will be absolutely essential for winning this run thanks to Sleep Powder, even if he doesn't have access to Compound Eyes because, well, abilities don't yet exist in Gen 2. Sponge is immediately able to evolve into Metapod and then we can go find our second encounter. Our second encounter for this run can either be a Spinarak that can be found at night or a Ladybird that can be found in the morning. Now normally, Spinarak would probably be the better choice here, but Ladybird has one advantage that is actually essential for making this run possible. We'll get to that in a second however. So welcome to the team Red Velvet. I can also always come back here later and catch a Spinarak when I have Headbutt, so it's not like I'm going to miss out on using one either way. That's actually the only two encounters we get before the first gym, and the more eagle-eyed among you will have already noticed a teeny tiny issue I'm about to run into. The first gym leader is Thalkner, and he's obviously going to be a nightmare for my two bug Pokemon. The main problem however for this fight is the fact that the level cap is only 9, meaning I can't evolve Sponge into Butterfree. If I was able to evolve Sponge, I'd have a fighting chance here, but because I can't, I'm going to have to rely on a really risky strategy instead. That's where Red Velvet comes in, because he has access to Supersonic. That's right, I'm going to have to pray I get super lucky with Confusion if I want to win this, so let's do this. I start the fight with Red Velvet, and Falconer starts with Pidgey. One small saving grace here is that Pidgey doesn't have a flying type move, but if I want to win this, I still need Red Velvet to take as little damage as possible before the Pidgeotto comes out. So turn 1, I go through a Supersonic, and it lands. And then Pidgey hits himself in Confusion. Good start. I then go through a weak tackle, and Pidgey breaks through the Confusion and lands a tackle himself. That's bad, but I can probably still get away with taking at least one more tackle before this becomes unwinnable. So I go through a second tackle, and Pidgey breaks through again. Okay, really need this stupid bird to start hurting itself here, or I'm kind of screwed. So I go through a third tackle, and just hope and pray, and Pidgey hurts himself. Okay, just need one more turn of Pidgey hurting himself, and we're still in this. So I land another weak tackle, and Pidgey breaks out of confusion, meaning I'm doomed. Unless Pidgey misses, we're still in this. Another tackle is then enough to take down Pidgey. One down, now to deal with the real problem. If I get stupidly lucky here, we could get through this first time, but again, I do need Pidgeotto to basically continuously hurt himself in confusion for that to happen. So Falconer's larger bird comes out, outspeeds, and lands a really scary gust. Red Velvet survives though, meaning I just need Supersonic to land, and of course, it misses. That's it. Even with a berry restoring his HP, Red Velvet can't survive another hit and land a Supersonic, meaning this is all over. On the next turn, Pidgeotto outspeeds and KOs my brave ladybug with a second gust. Sponge is out next and bravely tanks a gust before striking back with a massive critical hit tackle, but from there it's all over as another gust from Pidgeotto ends attempt 1. This is doable, but I'm going to have to get stupidly lucky to win this. Maybe attempt 2 will be the run? That idea is quickly cut short before we even get to the gym leader though by Bugkeeper Abe. Bugkeeper Abe is a with a murderous Spiro, who I only got past in my first attempt thanks to getting lucky with Supersonic and getting a crit. 
Unfortunately, attempt 2 doesn't go as well, as Red Velvet fails to land a supersonic, meaning this stupid Spiro is able to wipe my entire team. I'm starting to regret not playing Soul Silver at this point, but hopefully attempt 3 will go better. So attempt 3 starts slightly better than attempt 2, as we're actually able to make it to the gym leader this time around. Let's pray Red Velvet is feeling lucky. The fight against Pidgey is actually going really well, I've got him one hit away from being KO'd, and I've only taken one tackle. Just gotta land one more hit, and we'll be in a really good position for the Pidgeotto. So I click tackle, and of course, it misses, meaning Pidgey is able to get off a really strong tackle. 95% accurate tackles I swear, who thought that was a good idea? Of course, this messes everything up, because Red Velvet is now low enough to where Pidgeotto can come in, high roll, and end attempt 3. I get all the way to attempt 9 before I decide something needs to change, and that something is EVs, or DVs because this is generation 2. If I go and knock out unknowns in the ruins of Alf, I'll be able to slightly increase all my Pokemon stats before I get to Pidgeotto. The problem with this, I won't be able to get enough DVs to make a difference without over leveling. So for full transparency, I do kind of cheat and give my Pokemon more DVs than they should actually be able to get at their current level. I do realise this is kind of cheating in a sense, but I have tried 8 times to win this first gym fight and I haven't even been able to get Pidgeotto to below half. So for the sake of making this doable, it's necessary. So let's go see if with DVs I can finally beat the first gym leader on attempt 9. I get incredibly lucky on the first two turns as Pidgey is confused and then hurts himself in confusion twice. On the third turn, Pidgey does break out of confusion and lands a weak tackle, but that's the only damage he's able to get off before a fourth turn tackle from Red Velvet is able to take down Falconer's first bird. Good start, let's hope my luck holds out. Next, the Nightmare Bird comes out, so after Red Velvet is hit by a gust that still does a crazy amount of damage, I go through a Supersonic and miss. Okay, one last shot here, so I go through Supersonic again after taking another gust, and it lands. Run 9 is gonna be the run, I swear. So I go through a tackle that still doesn't do a lot, and Pidgeot hurts himself in confusion. Judging from how much damage that did, I need Pidgeot to hurt himself in confusion two more times, and I should win. So I go through a tackle, and of course, Pidgeot breaks out of confusion and nearly KOs Red Velvet. Unfortunately, Red Velvet is then outsped and KO'd on the next turn. Rest in peace, buddy. Unfortunately, Sponge tries as hard as he can to take down this murder bird, even bring it into the red, but he just can't quite stay alive long enough to get the KO, so he falls to another gust. DVs clearly make a huge difference, but they aren't enough to guarantee the win. That makes me feel slightly better about cheating. Just to show that they really aren't the guaranteed win, it's actually not until attempt 14 where anything actually interesting happens. I actually get fairly unlucky with Falconer's Pidgey, as it's able to get off 3 tackles before going down. However, it's against the Pidgeot where my luck finally holds up. Pidgeot hits himself twice in confusion, but then is able to bring Red Velvet low enough to where it looks like he's not going to survive the fight. Red Velvet decides that he's put in the work for this win though, and he's not ready to go down just yet. So I go through another tackle that crits, taking down Falconer's Pidgeotto. Finally, only took 14 attempts, but we've got the first gym badge and can now carry on with the rest of the game. Let's hope we don't run into any other roadblocks like this first gym. Thanks to our new level cap, we we're able to immediately evolve Sponge into Butter 3. It's very annoying that the level cap for Falconer was 9 instead of 10, but hey, at least we made it through, eventually. We're then able to run all the way to Idux Thoris to catch our next encounter, a Weedle we named Butter. I promise this isn't another bug only run in disguise, and eventually we'll catch some more Pokemon that aren't bug types, but for now, that's the only encounter we get before the second gym leader Bugsy. Before we get through to that though, a quick word from our sponsor. On to the second gym. Bugsy actually makes this fight a lot easier than it is in the remakes, Heart Gold and Soul Silver, as he starts with a Metapod. Starting with a Metapod means that I'm able to start with Sponge, put Metapod to sleep with Sleep Powder, and start going for Hardens. Once Sponge is at plus 6, I'm free to take down Metapod with two Confusions, and then take down Kakuna with only one Confusion. Right, now just Cypher to deal with. I decide to start with a Sleep Powder that misses. Lack of Compound Eyes being a pain right there. Luckily, Cypher just goes for a Fury Cutter, which doesn't do a lot. I'm slightly worried however, if Cypher can survive long enough to get off a lot of Fury Cutters, he might be able to bypass my plus 6 defense. That's because Fury Cutter increases in damage every time Cypher uses it. So on the next turn, I decide to just go straight for some damage, and Confusion does a worryingly low amount. Okay, now I have no choice but to try and put this thing to sleep again. So I start going for Sleep Powders and miss again. Okay, Fury Cutter still isn't doing a lot, but it is starting to build in damage. Luckily, on the next turn, Sleep Powder lands, so I'm able to start doing damage. 
Four turns of sleep later, the cipher finally is taken out by weak confusions. That was a bit scary, might not have seemed it, but doing that little damage meant if I'd gotten unlucky with sleep powders landing or cipher waking up, I could have possibly been swept. Made it through though, meaning we've got our second gym badge. We're now able to travel further into Ilex Thorust, meaning we can teach Red Velvet a headbutt. This opens up some new encounters for us. Back in Azalea Town, we can throw Red Velvet at a tree until an Apom falls out. Through the Apom, finally ends his bug only run, and he should be fairly useful with access to moves like Agility and Baton Pass. I'm really happy to add Fruit to the team, but as I'm admiring my new monkey and staring into those cold dead eyes, I get the feeling like I've forgotten something. Something important. Oh well, I'm sure it's nothing to worry about. Just outside Alex Thorest on Route 34, we're able to find our second purple normal type to this run, Ditto. Ditto will be an absolutely vital member of this team, and by that I mean I don't think he ever gets used. Least Angel is there for moral support. Carrying on past Goldenrod City, we can catch our next encounter, which of course is another bug type. Really shouldn't be surprised that there are so many bug types with the BTS below 400, but it would be nice to have a little bit more variety. Oh well, at least we finally got 6 Pokemon, as I'm able to add Pound, the Yang Mega, to my party. It's a good job we finally got 6 Pokemon, because up next is Whitney. Now Whitney isn't as hard as you remember her being from your childhood, as long as you can bring a couple of counters for her mill tank. Of course, I can't help but notice I don't really have any of those counters, and over half my team is weak to roll out. This could be a problem. I decide my best bet is relying on more luck based strategies, which I'm already sick of if I'm honest, but I can't really see any better options. So I decide to start with Sponge, while Whitney starts with Clefairy. Sponge is able to immediately outspeed and land a sleep powder, shutting down any metronome hacks this thing might try and pull. With Clefairy asleep, I decide to switch into Pound and start going through double teams. I'm able to get off 6 double teams, but one slight issue is that Clefairy uses Mimic to get off a few double teams of its own. This means Clefairy is able to dodge Sonic Booms long enough to land a Sludge Bomb, which is damage I would have really rather not have taken. Oh well, luckily that's all Clefairy is able to do before Pound lands one last Sonic Boom for the KO. Next is the Destroyer of Childhood's Miltank. Now rollout has low accuracy anyway, so with plus 6 evasion, I should be safe from rollout sweeping my entire team. What I'm not safe from though is the immediate attract at Miltank lands, which is going to make this really annoying. I couldn't really play around this attract though, because all of my Pokemon are male, so now I'm just going to have to deal with it. So I start spamming Sonic Booms, and after landing 2, the Fat Cow is brought to below half and Miltank starts going to milk drinks. I think maybe I can just keep going until Miltank runs out of PP, but apparently it's got 15 PP. This means I'm more likely to be hit before Miltank runs out of PP, especially because every other turn, Pound isn't attacking because he's distracted by Miltank's sexy sexy udders. This is getting bad, but I have to keep going and just hope the AI doesn't heal. This back and forth carries on for a while, and eventually Pound runs out of PP for Sonic Boom, so I have to start going for weak tackles. To make matters worse, Miltank lands two stomps in a row bringing Pound to below 50%. Pound is able to get off one more tackle and then Miltank lands a rollout. This is bad, but there's no way he lands another one, right? So I stay in, and of course, Miltank lands another rollout, KOing poor Pound. Rest in peace Pound, you did your best. Right, now I'm in real trouble as rollout will likely KO every single one of my remaining Pokemon, and I'm not sure if anyone can knock out this cow in one more hit. I decide my best bet is Red Velvet, who I've taught Thunder Punch from a TM. Red Velvet is likely to do more damage than anyone else on my team, other than Sponge, and I can't really risk Sponge, because without Sleep Powder, there's some fights I just don't think I can win. So I send in Red Velvet and go through a Thunder Punch, and of course, it just misses the KO by an inch, meaning that the stupid murder cow is able to land another rollout for a second KO. Rest in peace Red Velvet, without you, this run wouldn't have been possible. Luckily, Miltank is now low enough to where Sponge can come in, outspeed, and KO the stupid Miltank with a single confusion. We did it, third gym down, but at what cost? Johto really opens up after this point, meaning that we can at least go catch some new encounters to replace our fallen friends. Firstly, south of the Lake of Rage, on Route 43, we can find a Farfetch'd. Now I can definitely say, without any bias at all, that out of all the Gem 1 Duck Pokemon, Farfetch definitely isn't the best, but he does have access to Swords Dance, making him vital for guaranteeing later fights. Welcome to the team, Carrot. 
Another important encounter is in Olivine City. After listening to a random man rant about fishing, he gives us his good rod, meaning we can go catch ourselves a Corsola, ignoring the fact that the fishing animation in this game makes it look like I've had one too many energy drinks, Devil the Corsola will be an excellent addition to my party, simply based on the fact that I don't get any other water or rock types this run. After catching Karen and Devil, it's another easy rival fight before the next gym. Gotta say though that your rival in this game is kind of the d**k isn't he? Anyway, moving on, it's time for the 4th gym leader Morty. Morty is always fairly straightforward, so let's see how this goes. I start with Throop, while Morty starts with Ghastly. I've taught Throop Mudslap from a TM, meaning he's able to make quick work of the Ball of Gas and get the KO after only two Mudslaps. Second is Haunter, and because I got cursed last turn, I decided to switch into Carrot. Of course, Carrot is then immediately put to sleep on the switch, but luckily I equipped him with a Mint Berry before the fight, so he instantly wakes up. Can anyone tell me why it's a Mint Berry that wakes up your Pokemon in this game? Like, why Mint? Am I missing something there? Anyway, thanks to being woken up by a Berry, Carrot is able to land a strong peck that does over 50%, and then a second Hypnosis from Haunter misses. Perfect. Thanks to that miss, I'm thoroughly able to get off a second peck on the next turn to the KO. Third for Morty is his ace Gengar, and I try to get off another peck. Of course, Gengar lands a Hypnosis, and this time it sticks. I decide there's a really high chance Gengar is going to go for Dream Eater here, so on the next turn, I switch into Sponge. On the switch, my prediction is correct, meaning Gengar's attack fails. I then go through a Sleep Powder, but Gengar outspeeds and goes for a Hypnosis, but luckily it misses while Sponge connects with the Sleep Powder. Sponge is clearly the superior sleep setter. I'm then able to get off three confusions for the KO while Gengar naps. Easy. Last is Morty's second Haunter, but this proves to be easy as Confusion brings the ghost into the red, then Haunter gets confused and finishes himself off for the win. Morty is never a challenge, but it's nice to know he can still be swept with any direct counters to him. Fourth gym down, four more to go. Now we don't have any encounters before the next gym, meaning we can skip straight to Chuck and his fighting types. Chuck starts with his Primeape, but unlike in the remakes, it doesn't have any rock moves. This means I'm safe to start with Sponge. I immediately go through a Confusion that does over half, and then I get lucky and Primeape gets confused. Meaning instead of attacking, Primeape just hurts himself. A second Confusion is then enough for the KO. Good start. Second is Poliwrath, so I go through a Sleep Powder that lands. I then go through a Confusion as Chuck uses a Thor Heal. Didn't know he had that to be honest. Sponge doesn't care about that though, because he gets the Confusion again, and then goes on to land another Sleep Powder. Jesus Sponge, calm down. You could pretend this is slightly a challenge. Sponge clearly doesn't care about making this fight tense though, because he then KOs the Poliwrath with two more confusions. Another easy win goes to show that even with bad Pokemon, Johto's gym leaders suck. Fifth gym down. I now run into a slight problem. As the next gym leader's highest Pokemon is 35, and the gym leader's highest Pokemon after that is 31. I don't know why that's the case, but it does mean I'm gonna go fight Price first. But with a level cap of 31, and all of my Pokemon being 30, and with the Team Rocket base to clear, I've got a worrying chance at the leveling here. At least, even in retro Game Boy graphics, it's very entertaining to watch Lance murder a man. Once we make it through the Team Rocket base, it's time for the 6th gym, and unfortunately, through the APOM did over level to 32, meaning he'll be being benched through this fight. Luckily, Price shouldn't be any more difficult than the last couple of gym leaders. So I start off with Butter, and Price starts off with Seal. Seal turns out to be fairly easy, however, as a single crit Twin Needle from Butter immediately gets the KO. Second is Dugon, so I immediately start going for Twin Needles. Luckily, it doesn't take long for the Fat Seal to go down, as 3 Twin Needles is all it takes while Dugon spams very weak aura beams. Last the price is Pillow Swine, who would be an issue if it wasn't for Devil. Devil is able to come in on a blizzard that misses and then one shot with a surf. Easy. Sixth gym down. I was thinking this would be a bit more of a challenge with such bad Pokemon, but these gyms are laughable. To be honest though, using Butter the Poison Bug type has given me that feeling again that I've forgotten something. Oh well, I'm sure I'll remember eventually. Up next is the seventh gym leader Jasmine, who is slightly more difficult than the last few gym leaders but not by much. I start with Throot, who has now rejoined the team, while Jasmine starts with Magnemite. I immediately go for a super effective Mud Slap, which just misses the KO, meaning Magnemite is able to get off a Thunder Wave. That could be annoying, but luckily, on the next turn, Magnemite just goes for a Super Sonic that misses. Throot is then able to land another Mud Slap that KOs. Don't you know not to rely on Super Sonic Jasmine? Trust me, it's terrible. Next, the Jasmine is her second Magnemite. I don't see any reason to switch here, so I go through another Mud Slap. Of course, Jasmine doesn't 
doesn't follow my advice and goes for another supersonic and misses, meaning that Throot is able to bring the Magnemite into the red. Magnemite then lands a crazy strong thunderbolt that crits and does give me a slight heart attack. Throot then gets paralyzed, meaning Magnemite gets to live. Another crit here could actually KO Throot, but I decide there's no way that this thing is going to crit twice in a row, so I decide to stay in as Magnemite gets off another strong thunderbolt that doesn't crit and then I get the KO with another mud slap. Last the Jasmine is Steelix. Luckily, Devil counters this thing pretty well, so I send in Devil on an Iron Tail that lowers her defense. This is slightly scary because another Iron Tail would now do big damage and a crit would probably KO, but luckily Devil is able to outspeed and land a Surf, and because Steelix has paper for special defense, that's enough for the KO. Slightly more difficult gym fight there in that we actually had a chance to lose some Pokemon. Still no issues though, one more gym to go. Before we can get to the last gym leader however, we have to get our last couple of encounters for this run, the first of which we find on Route 40 Thor. On Route 40 Thor, we find a Licky Tongue, and does Licky Tongue make anyone else uncomfortable? Maybe that's just me. Anyway, Thorist will actually be pretty useful, as it can learn a decent amount of TMs, and Thorist will probably be my tankiest Pokemon. This probably makes me the only person to ever play Pokemon and be happy to find a Licky Tongue. I think that deserves a like on this video, doesn't it? Premium Licky Tongue content right here, so remember to subscribe if you made it this far and enjoyed. Only one more encounter to get then and it's everybody's favourite Christmas themed Pokemon, Delibird, who I find in Icy Path. Delibird should be really useful against Lance and his Dragon types, so he's 100% going to be an Elite Four Pokemon. Oh, okay, bye then. I didn't want you anyway, stupid Santa bird. With that out of the way, it's time for the last gym leader, Claire. And she's almost always the scariest gym leader in this game, thanks to her monstrous Kingdra. Luckily, it doesn't have Sniper this time around, so it's not as threatening as it would be in the remakes, but it should never be underestimated. Luckily, thanks to Carrot, I can do everybody's favourite strategy, set up sweep. So I start with Sponge, and Claire starts with the first of their Dragonairs. I go for Sleep Powder, but Dragonair outspeeds and lands a Thunder Wave, meaning Sponge gets paralysed. Bad start. Luckily, on the next turn, Dragonair goes for a slam that misses, and Sponge lands a Sleep Powder. Just gotta get a bit lucky here with Sleep Turns. So I switch into Carrot, who's able to get off an Agility, and Two Swords dances before Dragonair wakes up. Now I assumed the AI would go for Thunder Wave again here, which is why I equipped Carrot with a Paralyzed Cure Berry. However, instead, Claire's Dragonair just goes for a weak Surf. This allows me to get up a third Swords Dance. Had the AI gone for Thunder Wave there, I wouldn't have actually been able to get off a third Swords Dance, as I couldn't have risked Carrot being paralysed for a second time. At plus two, I'm not guaranteed to one-shot the Kingdra, so this fight could have gone very differently. As it is though, the AI let me set up Carrot to plus six attack, and from there it's all over. Carrot is able to one-shot each of Claire's Dragonairs with slashes, and then Kingdra suffers the same fate. Easy, with taking down the eighth and final gym. Now I do pay attention to feedback, and there are a decent amount of people that say setup sweeping is boring. Unfortunately, it is just off them the safest way to win. Luckily for the Elite Four, I'll be trying my best to avoid setup sweeps, so hopefully you can forgive me for using it against Claire. Anyway, with that out of the way, it's time to head to Kanto and push through Victory Road. I know the Kanto portion of these games can feel a bit tacked on, but still, taking that first step into Kanto when you don't know it's in the game is something really special. You know something else that's as special as that? This right here. I find my first shiny Pokemon on this YouTube channel. Now unfortunately, I won't get to use Sprinkle, but surely having the first Pokemon I run into in Kanto being a shiny has got to be a good sign, right? Sprinkle is the omen of good fortune, and I'd like to think it's thanks to his protection that we make it through Victory Road and our final rival fight with no issues, thanks to him. It's then time for a bit of team building, but honestly there's not really a lot to do so let's just see who we're bringing. Sponge, the Butter 3, Fruit, the Ambipom, Butter, the Beedrill, Forest, the Licky Tongue, Devil, the Corsola, and Carrot, the Farfetch'd. It's time for the final stretch. Can my awful awful Pokemon beat the Elite Four? Let's find out. First up for this Elite Thor is Will the Psychic type trainer, and with the level advantage this shouldn't be too difficult. So I start with Sponge and Will starts with Zatu. I immediately go through a Sleep Powder that misses, so Zatu is able to get off the strong Psybeam. Luckily on the next turn Sleep Powder connects, this means I'm safe for Throot to come in as Zatu stays asleep and start going for Shadow Balls. In Generation 2, Shadow Ball is physical, so it's the perfect move for Throot to learn to poke holes in Will's team. I've also given Throot a Spell Tag to make those 
Shadow Balls do even more damage. So Zatu goes down to a single Shadow Ball. Then Jinx comes out and suffers the same fate. Executor is third, and he's actually tanky enough to survive the Shadow Ball and set up a Reflect. The Reflect doesn't save him, however, because on the next turn, a second Shadow Ball is enough for the KO. Next is Slowbro, and with Reflect up, this thing could be a problem. I decide to go through a Shadow Ball to see how much damage it does, and it's actually not a lot at all. To make matters worse, Slowbro then goes through a curse, increasing its defense and attack. That's really scary, and there's no point keeping through in anymore with Slowbro's defense increases, so I switch into Forest. Slowbro gets up another curse as I switch. This thing needs to go down now, or I could end up getting swept. Luckily, I've taught Forest Thunder Punch, which ignores reflect and Slowbro's defense increases as it's a special move in this generation. I've also given him a magnet for increased damage. This increased damage pays off as Thorist is able to get off two thunder punches for the KO or Slowbro gets off another curse. That was scary but luckily the AI got greedy had it started going through body slams that could have gotten bad fast. Last the will is Zatu who is only able to get off two strong psychics for going down to do thunder punches. First member of the Elite Four down, only going to get more difficult from here though. Second for this Elite Four is Koga, who is fairly scary because most of this Pokemon know double team and status moves, so hopefully we can get KOs before they're able to set up. Koga's team has a lot of weaknesses to fire, so I thought Thorus Fire Punch, which should make quick work of over half of Koga's team. So I start with Thorest, and Koga starts with Ariados. Huh, you know seeing Ariados is giving me that feeling again that I've forgotten something? Oh well, I'm sure I would have remembered by now if it was important. I immediately go for Fire Punch, that annoyingly misses the KO, which allows Ariados to set up a double team. This could be bad, especially because on the next turn, Fire Punch misses. Thank god the AI is dumb though, because instead of going through another double team, the AI just goes through a weak Giga Drain. This means on the next turn, Forrest is able to land a Fire Punch for the KO. Easy. Second for Koga is Venomoth. Venomoth immediately lands a Supersonic, but Forrest is trying to prove to the world that Licky Tongues are actually useful and breaks through, landing a strong Fire Punch. Venomoth then lands a weak Psychic as Forrest breaks through and lands another Fire Punch for the KO. Next is Thortress, and Koga clearly doesn't know the type chart very well, as Forrest is able to cleanly one-shot with a four times effective fire punch after two turns of hurting himself in confusion. Fourth is Muck, so I switch into Sponge as Muck starts setting up minimizers. Sponge then misses a sleep powder as Muck lands a toxic. This could get bad. Luckily on the next turn, Sponge is able to do a lot with the Psy Beam while Muck goes through an acid armor that only increases his physical defense. I then try and go through another Psy Beam, but of course Sponge misses. Really wish Compound Eyes was a thing in this gen. To make matters even worse, Muck then gets off another minimize as toxic damage starts to stack. Sponge is able to pull through on the next turn though and land another Psy Beam that just misses the KO. Muck retaliates with a really hard sludge bomb but thankfully a berry heals Sponge out of the range of going down to Toxic on the next turn. Despite the fact that Sponge could survive another turn I decide it's not worth taking the risk so I switch into Carrot. On the switch Carrot takes another really hard sludge bomb which of course poisons. At least the poison means the Carrot can't be hit by Toxic. I then use Fly on Carrot which is a mistake to be honest because it might allow Muck to get off another double team. Luckily though, Muck just goes for another sludge bomb and then fly connects, taking down that overly large pile of goop. Last for Koga is Crobat, and this could get ugly if it sets up with too many double teams. My best bet for taking this monster out quickly is Devil, so I switch as Crobat immediately goes to the double team. Crobat then thankfully doesn't go through another double team and instead misses a toxic. Devil is then able to immediately land an ancient power. Just need one or more of those to hit, so as Crobat lands a toxic on the next turn, I hope and pray an ancient power connects again. That could have gotten ugly fast, but thanks to getting fairly lucky with not missing, we made it through with no issues. Next up for this Elite Thor is Bruno, who has some decent coverage and some strong Pokemon, so we need to be careful here. I start with Sponge, and Bruno starts with Hypnontop. Anybody else think Hypnontop looks very pissed off in this gen? I guess I would be as well if I was always upside down. Hypnontop immediately goes for a quick attack that crits and does a decent amount of damage through a quick attack. Sponge is able to retaliate and land a side beam that does just over half. On the next turn, Hypnontop top goes for a second quick attack and luckily doesn't crit and Sponge is able to KO with the second side beam. Second is Onyx and I'll never understand why they didn't give Bruno a Steelix. Oh well, easy enough to deal with. So I switch into Devil as Onyx sets up a Sandstorm. Sandstorm hurts the rest of Bruno's Pokemon so it's a bit strange for Onyx to have this move to be honest. Even with Sandstorm up 
though, a single Surf should be enough for the KO, but much to my surprise, Bruno hard switches into Hitmonlee. Surf still does a lot, but Hitmonlee threatens Devil with some really strong fighting type attacks. Because of this, I decide to switch into Butter, who tanks a double kick on the switch like it's nothing. A single Sludge Bomb is then able to finish off Hitmonlee. Third to Bruno is Hitmonchan, and annoyingly, Hitmonchan has really good coverage with the elemental punches, but I know it will go for Fire Punch here, so I'm fairly safe to switch into Carrot. Carrot eats the special Fire Punch on the switch like it's nothing, and then lands a fly for the KO. Then Bruno sends out his Onyx again, so I send in Devil on a Rock Slide and then KO with a single Surf. Last the Bruno is Machamp, and this thing kind of scares me. Because this thing is so threatening, I immediately switch into Sponge to try and put it to sleep. On the switch, Sponge takes a weak cross chop and then is immediately able to land a Sleep Powder. Gotta love Sponge. I then get insanely lucky with Sleep Turns, as Machamp stays asleep for 5 whole turns, meaning even after Bruno heals with a Max Potion, Sponge is able to get the KO with 5 side beams. My luck is actually crazy, like holy sh I'm not gonna complain though. One more member of the Elite Four to go, and it's Karen. Karen has some pretty powerful Pokemon, but I have some good matchups into each of them, so this shouldn't be too difficult. First, the Karen is Umbreon, while I start with Butter. Butter is able to bring Umbreon to 50% after a single Twin Needle, thanks to a boost in power from a held Silver Powder. Umbreon only retaliates with a Sand Attack. Butter clearly doesn't care about the accuracy drop, however, as a second Twin Needle then connects, bringing down Karen's tankiest Pokemon. Second is Houndoom, so I switch into Death on a weak 4 times resisted flamethrower. On the next turn, Houndoom outspeeds and hits a really strong crunch, but luckily, Devil is able to KO with a single Mystic Water boosted Surf. Third for Karen is Thile Plume, so I switch into Carrot on a Petal Dance that does nothing. I then go through a Fly that very nearly KOs the Toadstool, and Thile Plume confuses itself thanks to Petal Dance. A second Fly is then enough for the KO. Fourth is Gengar, who would be scary, but I have Fruit who handles it pretty easily, so I switch in as Gengar makes Fruit's job even easier by going through a curse, and then a single Shadow Ball takes down Gengar. That's the Elite Four down. Even without setup, that Elite Four is always pretty easy, and it had some really good luck. Gonna need that luck to carry on though, because now it's time to face our final challenge, Lance. Now because Deli Bird off, the only ice move I have is Ice Punch on Forest. However, combined with Devil's ancient powers, we should hopefully be able to pull off a win here. Let's go prove that even with the worst Pokemon in Johto, we still have what it takes to be champions. So Lance starts with Gyarados, and I start off with Forest. I immediately go for a Thunder Punch that annoyingly just misses the KO, and Gyarados is able to get off a strong Hyper Beam. Luckily, Forest is then able to finish off Lance's first Pokemon with a second Thunder Punch. Second is the first of Lance's three Dragonites, so I immediately go for an Ice Punch. Of course, Dragonite outspeeds and lands a Thunder Wave, but Thorist is able to break through and land the Ice Punch that eat them with a boosted Nethermelt Ice can't quite get the KO. This lets Dragonite get off another Hyper Beam that very nearly KOs, but luckily Thorist is an absolute beast and survives, meaning he can take down Lance's Dragon with a second Ice Punch. Third for Lance is his second Dragonite, and I have no choice here but to let Thorist go down, so with a heavy heart I stay in and watch as my long-tongued Pokemon is taken down by a third Hyper Beam. Rest in peace Thorist, you made this fight winnable. I immediately send in Devil, who is able to land a strong Ancient Power while Dragonite has to recharge thanks to Hyper Beam. Dragonite on the next turn lands another Hyper Beam, but thanks to Devil resisting and defense EVs, Devil tanks the move easily and gets off a second Ancient Power, narrowly missing the KO. However, Dragonite has to recharge again on the next turn, so a fourth Ancient Power is easily able to KO. Third to the Lance is Charizard, which is a strange choice as Charizard can only do minimal damage with a Hyper Beam before being one shot with a four times effective Ancient Power. Lance then sends out Aerodactyl, who immediately lands a really strong rock slide that gets the flinch. Luckily, a berry heals back some of the damage, so on the next turn, after landing a second scary rock slide, Aerodactyl goes down to a single surf. I am enjoying how hard Lance's team is bodied by Corsola, of all things. Lance is down to his last Pokemon, his third and final Dragonite. It's been working so far, so I go through another Ancient Power. Dragonite once again outspeeds and lands a strong Outrage that just misses the KO before taking a strong Ancient Power. Unfortunately, I've reached the point in the fight where I'm going to have to let another one of my Pokemon go down, so I salute as I watch as Lance's Dragonite KOs another of my Pokemon. Rest in peace, Devil. I decide my best bet is Sponge, who 
immediately comes in and gets off a Psybeam. Unfortunately, Psybeam does next to nothing and then Dragonite lands a critical hit outrage that does a huge amount. With Psybeams doing so little, I decide my best bet is trying to put the scary dragon to sleep, so I go through a sleep powder and Sponge comes through like always and it lands. With Dragonite asleep, I decide to take a risk and go through a Supersonic. Of course, Lance then uses the Thor Restore and Supersonic misses, and now I'm staring down a Thor Health Dragonite. This could get scary. I know I have no other choice though, but to hope Sleep Powder lands again, and Sponge pulls through again. Have we checked that Sponge doesn't have compound eyes? Like, I know it doesn't exist in this game, but I mean, I'm starting to think maybe he's just got it early or something. Unfortunately though, Sponge's luck is kind of null and void, because Lance then uses the Thor Heal, which I didn't even know he had to be honest. With Sleep Cured again, I then go through a third Sleep Powder that lands again. Sponge, you are absolutely insane. I go through one more side beam as Dragonite stays asleep, before deciding it's probably better to switch into through. Through is able to come in and get off three strengths for the KO while Dragonite stays asleep, winning us the run. What has my luck been for this Elite Four? Sponge is an actual god. I can't believe we made it through with so little issues. I need to go buy a lottery ticket. Well, this run has been incredibly fun and I'd definitely like to try a run like this again in the future on a harder game. Thank you all so much for watching if you've made it this far. I hope you enjoyed the video as much as I did playing it. Remember to like and subscribe to show your support and if you've got suggestions for future runs, please let me know in the comments. I'll see you all next time.